for your where you're coming in from. It would be nice to hear from you. We'll just give people a couple minutes to filter in. Brooklyn, Oakland. Berkeley. Vegas. Nice. Um, I think we can just go ahead and get started. And if people miss a little bit, it will be of my intro and not of the conversation. So that is excellent. Um, hi, my name is Claire Schwartz. I'm the culture editor at Jewish Currents, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to an evening with two artists I admire tremendously, Katz Tepper and Greg Bordowitz, for a conversation that will engage and orbit Katz's experimental film, Roasted Cockroach for Scale. The social practice project made in collaboration with the artist's father reminds me how care makes evident that records of distance are also traces of connection, how a need is also an invitation to join with. The film is less story and more dwelling, a non-narrative form that reminds me that language, if it is anything, is an expression of desire for and a way of being together. Katz and Greg are two artists in whose work I hear reverberating the opening lines of Tony Cade Bambara's The Salt Eaters. Are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? Just so you're sure and ready to be healed because wholeness is no trifling matter. I can't wait to see how they think and imagine together. Katz Tepper is an interdisciplinary artist working across video, text, installation, and sculpture. Their work casts an inward gaze to reflect on environmentally scaled situations, concerned with entanglements that dissolve boundaries between internal and external. Tepper's work has been presented in solo exhibitions at White Columns, New York and Atlanta Contemporary, Georgia, and in group shows including Sick Time, Sleepy Time, Crip Time, Against Capitalism's Temporal Bullying, very good title, at Red Bull Arts Detroit, an offense around the Torah, safety and unsafety in Jewish life at the Jewish Museum of Maryland. Publications featuring their work include Mouse Magazine, Art in America, Art Papers, Art Review, and Burn Away. Tepper was born and raised in Florida and is based in Athens, Georgia. They are a recipient of the Wynn Newhouse Award, a McDowell Fellowship, and an FCA Bridge Fund grant. They earned a BFA from Cooper Union and an MFA from Bard College. Since the late 1980s, writer, artist, and activist Greg Bordowitz has made diverse works, essays, poems, performances, drawings, sculptures, and videos that explore his Jewish and queer identities within the context of the ongoing AIDS crisis. Bordowitz was an early participant in New York's ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, where he co-founded various video collectives, including Testing the Limits, an advocacy group within ACT UP, and DIVA, Dam Interfering Video Activists. While developing a visual language capable of communicating harm reduction models to a broad public in his collaborative works, he made his own videos and television broadcasts that juxtapose performance documentation, archival footage, role play, and recordings of protest demonstration, demonstrations, drawing influence from feminist conceptual art. In recent years, Bordowitz has increasingly introduced poetry and performance as art events, exploring histories of music and televised stand-up comedy. Moving between multiple genres, the artist's work contemplates an expanded concept of portraiture as a mode of political and artistic address. So please join me in welcoming Katz Tepper and Greg Bordowitz. Since we're gathering across distance and technological mediations, please do feel free to use the chat to offer affirmations or wonderings or just underscore language that moves you or to gesture to where you're moved. Um, if you wanna ask questions of Katz and Greg, um, please use the Q&A box. And there's also closed captioning. If you um, just turn on the little closed captioning box at the bottom of the screen, that should appear. So I will now hand it over to Katz and Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Hi, Katz. Hey, Greg. And thank you, Claire. And thank you, everyone, for being here and to Jewish Currents for hosting. Yeah, thank you, Claire and Cynthia and Jewish Currents. And thank you, Katz, for being in conversation with me. It's been delightful to get to know you. And I think your video, Roasted Cockroach for Scale, is a 
brilliant work and I'm very happy to be talking to you about it. Ah, thank you so much. This all means so much to me and um, I'm very thrilled to be getting to have this conversation. <laughs> Um, so I guess we'll, we'll talk for a bit. You're going to show some clips and then we'll uh, round up our talk for Q&A, maybe 15 minutes or so before the end of the session. And then we'll take the questions in the Q&A. Um, so I was thinking that uh, most of uh, what one sees when one watches your video is text, uh, but the text is very much mediated. And so it led me to think that, uh, or again, realize that text reveals and conceals. Text both reveals and conceals. It's hard to tell in what proportion does, uh, does it conceal more than it reveals. Um, we know this from linguistic theory, but we also know this from uh, Torah study. It's a principle of Torah study that uh, text reveals and conceals. Uh, so I'm wondering how you arrived at your use of text and why. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll put a definitive, definitive question mark behind that one. Uh, I'm wondering how did you arrive at using text in your video and the way it's used? Thank you for that. Um, okay. I was really interested in uh, remote technology from a really expansive definition um, as just anything that can connect experience like distance. Um, so I did use uh, various internet um, interfaces like Zoom and Google to bridge this distance with uh, my dad, but I was also thinking about other ways to think about what a remote technology could be. And I thought of text uh, in the Jewish tradition as um, a material that kind of sits at this weird threshold between material and immaterial, um, and that has been utilized to to record and transfer like across crisis conditions and ex experiences of distance in diaspora. Um, the way text ended up being used in the film had a lot to do with like evading cinematic camera footage. Um, wanting to question certain ideas of representation and also to be kind of in this constant unfolding of revealing and concealing around the subject matter, which is not shown nor directly named most of the time. Um, and I guess as someone who didn't come into it feeling like a, a writer, but super invested in language. Um, I was kind of just like, what, what are all the things I could possibly do with language? Um, like speech, translation, transliteration, uh, scripting, AI speech to text software that generates its own keywords and that becomes its own poetics. Um, and kind of just trying to push to the limit the ways we could generate text around a kind a relational experience. Um, yeah, I hope I'm, I'm responding okay. You're doing great. I mean, that's all um, very interesting and we can unpack that more um, as we go. I was thinking that um, there used to be a, uh, well, I'm revealing my age because I'm referring to your work as a video and you're referring to it as a film. It's both and neither because uh, it's um, it's what it is now. <laughs> it's in the mediums now. So it is a film. Well, I'll refer to it as a film. Um, uh, uh, yeah, 
that's uh, my age and <clears throat> remembering porta packs and things like that, uh, which you did not use. Uh, it seems to me that most that the entire film was made within the computer. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, just to say, I I call it a film because it has a beginning and end, which is maybe where I'm thinking like it's not video art or just like it though it is very non-narrative in a lot of ways um there's 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 an arc and um but yeah it's completely generated uh through through screen recordings and um is very invested in like whatever this space is uh i just i really was excited to adapt to the the pandemic's like formal interference, I guess, if that makes sense. Like one of my big interests is how illness and disability disrupt form. Um, and I, like my first and foremost concern was that I would make something that I didn't have to leave the house <laughs> or like put a physical or financial and other kinds of resources in and that could be accessed without leaving the house. Cause that's that like beyond the pandemic is my experience as a chronically ill person. I don't go to art museums and so much of how I access art is through reading. Um, so just to say like, I really wanted something that that's whole materiality was built through a remoteness and that had an expanded set of meanings uh, invested in that. You're very successful at it. Um, being a poet, I do look at it as poetry. Um, and in some ways, uh, portions of it look like a new kind of concrete poetry, uh, particularly when you have your father sound out words um, with a huge circle in the middle of the screen. Um, that reminded me a lot of sound poetry and concrete poetry. Uh, you know, it's really a 19th to 20th century uh, phenomena that the word becomes an image. So th this distinction between word and image is defeated uh, by technology over and over again, and uh, increasingly so with uh, the new interfaces that we use daily. Um, but this concealing and revealing and the tactic of evading or not showing footage in order to reveal perhaps uh, a deeper set of feelings or produce curiosity and uh, even wonder um, in the viewer is something that's also inherited from trauma and trauma studies. Uh, I use that tactic in my work too. Um, to not uh, fulfill in any satisfying way or uh, any way that is just simply illustrative of some kind of um, trauma, let's say illness um, or loss or mourning, uh, but to uh, use language uh, and text and uh, composition to evoke affects and feelings and, and to provoke questions uh, rather than simply depict. And uh, you do that extremely well in the video. I know you have some clips. Do you want to show a clip? Yeah. Um, and it's just if, uh, if this isn't coming through, um, you know, hit us up in the chat, but just to know it's, if it seems like the sound in the uh, words aren't synced, that is actually part of the video. Okay. If this artwork needs footage, Colon, colon, noscopy, 
footage. <laughs> yeah, that's the part I had in mind when I was thinking about concrete poetry and sound poetry. Um, and it's funny. It's really funny, but you're talking about a colonoscopy. Um, and, and there are serious implications. Um, I'm sure people have watched the video coming to it, but it's good to have these uh, clips to punctuate certain uh, points that we want to make. Can we talk about humor a bit? How, what you say evading using the footage produces well, my opinion, it kind of produces this uh, kind of distance or alienation effects where the viewer hovers, doesn't really know quite how to feel about what's going on. At least that's my take on it. Yeah. I, I don't know how to feel about what's going on a lot of the time. Um, I mean, this scene, you know, I, I don't have access to to my own colonoscopy footage, which is a sort of bizarre, um, invasive fact. <laughs> um, and I was also really interested in like the cerebral space of the colonoscopy, so to speak, um, because I think the film video piece is a kind of metaphorical colonoscopy in that it's um, this sort of inward journey and like kind of working through my own body bodily material in some ways and also sort of having my dad look at my digestive contents but never directly always uh as they are like presented through a symptoms journal or something um which is its own to me like textual artifact of illness but I guess yeah this question of like invisibility um, or like what footage I, what, what I can image. Um, there are so many things that I can't access either because their nature is invisible or various systems of power, like control how the visuals are accessed and produced. Um, and I guess that brings in humor because it is all like, you know, I'm very interested in humor that's like on that edge of violence or tragedy. Um, and I've heard you speak about this and I have a very similar definition, which is that humor is like a bodily somatic release and like a breathing exercise in a way. And um, yeah, I think that a lot of the, the things we're hovering around in this film are um, are pretty dire uh, historical and contemporary circumstances. And we, we need humor and need to be able to even look at them at all. And, and we never even really look at them or maybe we're looking at them from a different part of our bodies besides our eyes, which is also, I, you know, I'm very interested in the other organs or parts of a body that are both like expressive and witnessing. Um, and my dad is an incredible entertainer and a natural comic and uh, is game. And by the way, he's here tonight and thank you, dad. <laughs> um, he's game, you know, it was such a participatory experience to make this. Um, and I never knew exactly what I was uh, setting up for him until he would activate it. You know, so I did just like type those elongated words phonetically and he immediately understood what to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing collaboration because uh, your dad in the video film is funny and also very loving. It's a very loving relationship. Uh, I had the feeling that I was on the inside of a conversation uh, that that was kind of private. Um, I understood and could see very well how you were um, composing. And there are moments where you actually call our, the viewer's attention to your 
conscious moves in composition because uh, there's a lot of self-reflexive moments. Uh, but still, there was it, it, it comes through as this very strong, intimate, and loving relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad should really be the one being interviewed because I feel like everything good that, or I don't know, I'm, I framed things, but uh, we were in a very, I, I guess like the film is 47 minutes and it's kind of just showing these slivers of a nine month or 10 month, what I call a social practice project in which we spent a lot of time on Zoom doing a lot of weird things is what I would call it. And a lot of that is only presented as a kind of peripheral um, like sliver or detail where you never get to the middle of what we were actually saying, um, but it produces, I think, a certain emotional intensity or hints of a certain context. And like an example is just the very first scene uh, my dad's reading a transcription of my speech uh, and he's saying, Clarice Lis have you ever read Clarice Lispector? No, Clarice Lispector, amazing, really amazing. This is not political. And saying this is not political, like only makes sense in the context of the fact that like we're arguing constantly about what we're maybe calling political. Um, and like, I, I don't know, I mean, to bring it back to humor, you know, my dad and I are coming together across like various ideological disagreements and just like different positionalities. And I think humor is um, what allows us to share what we share um, across disagreement and yeah, because like our, there is, I don't know how much it comes through, but con our, our kind of in, internal conflict is, um, was the main experience in some ways and a kind of working through over time. And a lot of the things we did, you know, we went, we used Google maps to go to where he was born in Ukraine. We, um, he read my symptoms journal. I wrote over a hundred pages of scripts that we recorded almost all of, even though a fraction makes it in. And throughout the whole writing process, like I'm writing in things he's saying. So when I first, I had maybe written one paragraph of the introduction, like my name is Heim Tepper. The, this film is Roasted Cockroach for Scale. And I called him immediately like, dad, any chance you're up for reading something I'm working on? And his first question was, is it a project about hating my country? Um, so which, which immediately gets written in and like, I guess any sense I had that I could somehow avoid his Israeliness, which is the country he's referring to, um, you know, immediately I'm confronted with the fact that that's going to be like a thematic, a necessarily thematic part of it. Well, humor is a very close relative of anxiety so there is an underlying anxiety i think um in the humor of the work because it's really tackling uh serious subjects like diaspora and illness um we we've talked so i, I i'd like to further talk with you about what you think are the relationships between diaspora and uh, illness. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's this kind of question in the film around epigenetics and I don't want to ever present it as this one-to-one um, -one thing like, oh, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I don't want to present epigenetics as this one-to-one -one thing where like necessarily the things that happened to my grandparents are playing out in this one-to-one -one way in my body. Though um, I believe something has been trans transmitted and also the narrative has been reinforced in me so much and all of the consequences of the afterlife 
have been reinforced in me. So I think that that's all playing out. Um, I mean, like formally, I'm very interested in how illness and diaspora share these relationships to, um, to space and time, like so changing and abstracting space and time. Um, going back to that idea of remoteness and how I, I really came to, to remoteness through disability, but actually discovered in it diaspora. Um, but I think for me, both are states of like non-fixity and um, not being whole or like set and uh, being like fractured. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, like I'm very much into celebrating that fracture and, and privileging it. Um, I'm pri like privileging a fragmentary non-whole uh, understanding of both like the body and nation um, as like not closed with borders basically. Um, yeah. Yeah, I understand it too. Um, I don't know if I would use the word diaspora. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely see the connection between um, the notion of uh, transit and ever changing and moving and crossing boundaries uh, as it relates to illness, crossing thresholds, uh, being constantly on the move or being moved. Um, I've had that experience as a person with uh, HIV of, you know, me being here, I'm here and there's my pain. Um, I, I observe my pain, uh, except when, uh, and I've had this experience when the pain is so searing that that fictional distance collapses. Uh, so there are these moments where this kind of fictional eye that it observes one's own illness uh, completely becomes one with the symptom and then there are these other times like the journal or the ways in which we are able to observe ourselves necessarily observe ourselves um in terms of taking medications or uh, choosing what to eat so you know we're definitely in dialogue with ourselves during that and uh, it is a very mobile situation when we talked uh before we had a few conversations before this talk you said that that related to trans experience. I was, was wondering if you could kind of elucidate or expand on that. Yeah, I mean, we were sort of questioning, like, what does it mean to have a home, including in one's body? And uh, I realized that that was, you know, complicated for me by, by transness and illness simultaneously. And I feel like my transness is ill or my illness is trans and they're not able to be separated. But, um, you know, I, I think I just like being in a, in my, in a body and which I don't even like language fails me. Cause I don't even think it's a body or I don't think it's this closed unit. It's like this sponge that is absorbing its environment constantly and is also things are imposed upon it. <laughs> Um, so I, I think I'm just, you know, I like play is such an important part of my, my work and how I, I guess, approach embodiment, um, because, you know, in the film, like queerness is not really even named as subject, but I consider it to be enacted or operative and the fact that I'm, an assigned female at birth person <laughs> saying things like, I can't tell the difference between me and my father. Um, he's like, I'm writing words for him. He's reading my words and we're becoming like this, uh, this, this soup together. Um, and, you know, I hadn't even changed my name when I had first started this. Um, and I'm, I'm non-binary, but I, I'm interested in masculinity and how it's playing out in my film um, because I think in a lot of ways, like this would be a completely different piece if I had done it with my mom, who's also a Jewish immigrant with a different diasporic background. Um, I'm, I think I was really pushing up against certain cultural traits 
that I consider Israeli or Zionist, um, that my dad both does and doesn't slightly embody in various ways around like kind of this trifecta of ableism, militarism, and um, masculinity. And I'm really interested in that kind of, I guess, anti-Semitic trope of the like diasporic Jewish male being sort of feminized or non-binary and like pushing up, uh, trying to maybe inhabit a different kind of masculinity alongside my dad. And um, actually maybe I'll play a little clip. Please. Okay. I really uh, think it's funny Oops. that you have the. Sorry, is that going through? Uh, it says it's paused, but okay. That's it's not. Yes, it is. Okay. Say something. I really uh, think it's funny that you have the weightlifting bars next to in the shot. In the office. Oh, oh, oh. The father thinks that weakness is great. <laughs> the weakness expresses the deep. Oh, sorry. No image. No image, yeah. Okay. Um, interesting to have no image. Can we try one more time and we won't? Let's, let's try one more time. Okay. Here you go, I could see the image now. Okay, cool. I really uh, think it's funny that you have the weightlifting bars next to, in the shot, in the office. Oh, oh, oh. The father thinks that weakness is great. The witness expresses the deepest human sensitivity. Is that what you mean? <laughs> irony, the irony of the whole thing. What's that text? Dear Father, it is good to be weak. Love, the artist. Okay. Um, I love I love that part. Uh, that's so, so hilarious, and it really does come out of. I'm pretty sure it comes out of a lot of role play. I mean, I, as a filmmaker, I can tell that you you probably had a large ratio of material that uh, you had to work with. Because um, I don't know, you can tell me, but it's my experience that that, that kind of play comes out of a lot of time recording and then you get those kind of gems. I mean, that's so brilliant. Um, and uh, you've already started, but we should maybe pursue further. Uh, we've talked about the difference between uh, a Zionist notion of gender and uh, you, a historical Jewish notion of gender, which you've called anti-Semitic, which is, is true, the anti-Semitic tropes about Jewish male femininity have uh, are uh, are anti-Semitic and are based on a lot on misperceptions uh, and ignorance about Jewish life, like circumcision and things like this. Uh, but actually, it also is based in history. That Daniel Boyarin, I don't know if you know you know this book, but Daniel Boyarin wrote this book on heroic conduct, which is about uh, how. Uh, Jewish northern Northern European Jewish life uh, was run in such a way that women had a, a far greater latitude of movement in business, especially because men were expected to study. And uh, it's still a patriarchal society. There's no claim here that this is necessarily um, more progressive, but it was just a fact of Jewish life before M. Bourgeoisement in Northern Europe that women were, middle-class women uh, like Glickel of Hamel were uh, business people 
that uh, afforded their husbands the ability to uh, study. And so there is a kind of feminization of the male that Boyarin talks about that then gets taken up uh, as an anti-Semitic trope. But I feel like I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living that anti-Semitic trope. I am that anti-Semitic trope, um, you know, bad at sports, um, which we called Goyam Nachist when I was growing up. Um, so like, uh, I totally get it. And I also, it, it, you know, being a child of the 60s and being raised in the 70s, I, I always saw my masculinity uh, and gender <clears throat> In relation to a lot of coordinates, but one of them was the ideal Sabra uh, uh, Israeli Jew stereotype of an Israeli male Jew uh, uh, who was militarized and healthy, and uh, uh, which is also a stereotype. Um, but uh, uh, so, but I, I, I still, our, our gender notions, our notions of gender are formed by these, um, or informed uh, by these cultural caricatures. And uh, so I think, I agree with you, you have your, your finger on a, a, an interesting point here. Um, Th thanks. I mean, I also want to, like, inhabit the anti-Semitic trope and in all of its glory, I guess, like, um, but I also see how much internalized anti-Semitism produced this other culture, which I think so many tenets of that culture are like literal translations of kind of, yeah, internalized anti-Semitism or trying to uh, be the very things that be, be the opposite of what they've been painted as. Um, so they are like obsessed with uh, acquiring land, working the land, which was denied for various periods of history. Um, you know, I think so like something that's coming up in the film a lot is that disability has like surrounded my dad from me and my grandparents. And it's just something that was not named. Um, and wasn't, wasn't, you know, in the early unfolding of the film, there's a line where my dad says, uh, or, or I wrote for him to say, um, I have never talked about how my mother was sick, no matter my avoidance, the sickness has time traveled into the artist. Um, of, you know, one of my preoccupations when I started was to be like thinking about eugenics and you know, the big H, uh, not so much around Jews only, but also around disability and disabled people and queer people and other people who were, um, and other racialized minorities that were uh, part of the final solution. Um, and I think that, you know, those all exist, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is ableism sort of undergirds the eugenics project so that um, because ableism purports that there is such a thing as an inferior body, thereby a queer body can be inferior or a racialized body can be inferior. And like, I'm all of the above. So I kind of um, exist like against that, that specter of, eugenicist desire and um but yeah I mean I think things get in turn I think in whatever ways this film is like con confronting trauma and psychic damage um in, in a family it's very concerned with with what gets internalized and like what um what happened what the what paths victims take to like feel safe which are not always um, just ones. And um, yeah, you know, I think my hi, my dad is a really interesting person because this isn't included in the film, but it, it's a really beautiful thing. He said, while we were making it, um, I was born in diaspora 
then I was taken to a place that supposedly was not diaspora. And then I re diasporaed myself. So as much as he's got certain um, characteristics that I associate with Israeli culture, such as being a farmer, um, he's also not. And he's also very much this person who's had so many migrations as to have like no real sense of home. And um, so, you know, there's ways that I kind of pit us as like being in, um, you know, disagreement with each other. But at the same time, I think he's sort of setting a lot of examples for me. Does that make sense? Um, well, that makes total sense. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, yeah, I think it should be said that, you know, we can talk about Jews. Um, I think we share uh, a similar trajectory in that my the coordinates of my family are uh, Bessarabia, Minsk, Pinsk, and Bialystok. Um, and so we're talking about, um, European Jews, uh, Eastern European Jews. Um, we can't say the Jews. The only people who say the Jews are people who hate us. Uh, we can talk about Jews, uh, but actually Jews mean a lot of different people. There are a lot of different Jews and there are Jews of every ethnicity, uh, and, uh, race and, um, and all over the world. So uh, it's important to recognize the diversity and um, multiplicity of Jews. Uh, and, uh, but also it's, it's important to, part of that work is in telling different Jewish stories and, and talking about inheritance, how we do come to inherit uh, characteristics. You talked about the body being porous. You've mentioned epigenetics way before epigenetics. Um, Freud talked about the phylogenetic inheritance, which was, you know, actually all humans have a phylogenetic inheritance. That's the civilization that precedes their birth uh, with all its inherent conflicts and traumas. Um, and uh, later in psychoanalytic theory, there's much about uh, how anxiety and, uh, and happiness, how emotions are transferred from caretakers. Let's not even say parents, but caretakers, because uh, parents are really composite figures for an infant. Uh, so yes, our bodies are always, our emotional, our, our emotions especially are formed through our relations, through relationality, through our most intimate relations and continue to develop through our intimate relations. Um, and your, your video does a great deal. It's very complex. It actually seems deceptively simple, but we've taken a lot on in this film and it's very complex. And uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I promised that, uh, you that we would get Kafka in there. And I had a little fun fact about Kafka for you that I didn't tell you, but I once heard uh, the great translator, Joachim Neugruschel, uh, talk about translating the metamorphosis. Uh, and I think he was only the only second person to translate it into English, the second person to translate it into English from the one that we all read, the only translation that existed. And Joachim Neugruschel noted that in the first sentence, something like Gregor Samsa wakes up to find that he's a cockroach. Actually, the German word that's used is ungezeifer, which means vermin. It's not cockroach. So actually in, in Neugruschel's uh, translation, it says Gregor Samson woke up to find himself vermin, uh, which puts a very different twist on how we read the metamorphosis. Um, did you know that or did you? I, I feel like I've intercepted that and not held on to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in my various like studying of Kafka. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you said you said you set out to make a video about Kafka and you didn't. And I said, you did. <laughs> I think you, I think you did. I don't mean to contradict the artist, but uh, from my point of view, you made an excellent video that makes use of Kafka. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for bringing Kafka in. I mean, 
I guess to bring it back to this question of humor and also inheritance, like I, I actually did find a, a roasted cockroach in my oven and it struck me as both absurd and tragic that I necessarily had these extremely brutal associations with this like rather banal incident and the ways that um, just the fact that we live in the shadows of so many genocides gets imbued in the everyday objects of our lives. Um, but, you know, I mean, when I read, reread The Metamorphosis for this, um, I was most struck by the ending where it ends on the, Gregor Samsa has died basically of neglect from his family. Um, and it ends with his parents, like, admiring his sister's young, able body, essentially. Um, which is, like, again, I think a place where, like, Gregor Samsa's otherness is, like, racialized, gendered, uh, queered, and disabled all in one. Um, those are all operative to me um, in that. And I was, yeah, I was just thinking about their kind of like disturbing desires and how cool Gregor Samso was just like crawling all over the walls. And, you know, I actually like could not kill a cockroach because of this piece. And I mean, like one of the, I would say the two most important lines for me in this piece are both these rhetorical questions that are really plain speech language, but are extremely loaded to me. And one of them is, what is the difference between an infestation and a population? And the other is, what does it mean for a body to be normal? Um, and yeah, I think those are both like coming out of Kafka to me, or I also wanna say that, you know, there are so many part aspects of life that are kafka s uh, for everybody, I think, medicalized people experience extremely laborious bureaucratic processes that that are like definitionally Kafka-esque. And I was really thinking about just like, what do you make when so much of your time and resources go toward like fighting to be able to live in a society that like is not built for you? Um, so just to say that that kind of brings it back to just the form of the piece and like kind of refusing to separate it from life, refusing to separate conversations with my dad and time we spend texting and doing everyday things from like what constitutes the aesthetic experience that I want to make into, yeah, like what constitutes aesthetics and what constitutes um, uh, maybe I'll just play one more little clip and then we'll yeah. sure we're, we're at we're at 750 so we should take some okay. questions but sure. why don't you show the clip and then we'll take questions okay it looks like the you just completed entailed not being in good health. That was what it was all about. Physically and mentally, the artist had to run to the bathroom in the middle of making art and the artist is trying to heal their father to ex excise his trauma. Doesn't sound like a very good health here. And yet, this is, a, this is the art the artist makes. I love that. That's uh, really beautiful. Um, 
And in some ways it answers a question that's been posted, but I think it might be interesting uh, to meet this question head on. Uh, so does the artist have a vision of health of, or what would it mean to be healthy? Um, it's not a desire, I guess, if that makes sense. It's not, I, I don't, or it, or it is, but it's also not, I guess, just to say like, disability is built, is, is something that will ha come for everybody. And it's a, it's a natural part of having a body. And yet it is also expedited for various populations because of violence and neglect and environmental uh, racism and various factors. Um, so it's like, in one sense, you know, we need to be fighting the forces that uh, disable people unnecessarily or to be expanding everyone's access to the option to be, to even be healthy. And at the same time, I'm like, illness has given me more than it's taken away. And I can't fantasize personally about, I, I like illness gives me a consciousness that I, it's like tuned me into my body and into relations in a way that, um, and into form and into questions about what art is. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't want to not, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't choose my illness, but it's, um, Irre I don't think anyone can be healthy in this world anyway, just to say, because um, maybe maybe a few people that have their own islands could somehow avoid uh, absorbing the various um, poisons, both chemical and uh, temporal that permeate our lives. <laughs> Yeah, I identify with that strongly. I, I think about it a lot. I tested positive for HIV when I was 23. Uh, that was in 1987. That was well before any effective medications. Um, I almost died, uh, but was lucky enough to hang on uh, until 1996 when there were effective medications. Um, and I also was in trials of medications that damaged my organs. So uh, and lots of my friends were not lucky enough to survive till 1996. Um, all to say that I can't imagine, like, I can't go back and like rewrite how I got here. You know, I just can't like, you know, what would the, what would, I can't answer the, what would have, or what could have been. Um, I re literally just can't imagine it in any kind of credible way. I don't fantasize about it or um, I'm just where I am now. Um, and right now I'm very happy to be talking to you. Me too. I mean, illness has introduced me to the coolest people. <laughs> and I mean, like the world experienced an, a, a shared experience of mass illness, though it wasn't distributed evenly. And I think really interesting things happened and I personally have been very saddened by the general desire to like erase the, everything that everything good that came out of it. While I also feel like there's a propensity to actually erase what really needs to be confronted, which is the grief um, and like actual just severe um, terror, like, yeah, I don't know, that de devastation, but um again, like I wanted to make an artwork that embraced that illness, like was going to shut down a lot of things and by shutting them down, open up other things. Um, and that that's, I guess how I, like every interruption opens a new way to think about materials and, and time and space. Um, illness has also like, connected me to the earth in new ways. I don't know. I just, I, I can't, 
I'm grateful. I'm grateful for getting to interface with you, Greg, and for your work, which when I was 20 and no knew no one who was going through what I was going through, I could read about your colonoscopy and know that that was a like legitimate thing for me to think about as an artist. So I don't know, you know, I've inherited a lot of really special things through illness. <laughs> well, thank you for your kind words about my work. Um, and I, I feel the same, I can just give witness and it's for the sake of brevity, say I very much appreciate what you're saying right now and, and connect with it strongly. Perhaps if there's another question, someone can type it into the Q&A box. Oh, there's two questions in the Q&A box, okay. Uh, the film has such a wonderful rhythm with the repetition and the syncopation of text and sound. How did you think about the rhythm of this film? What were you hoping to communicate through its rhythm? Um, you know, the film is like a, an exercise in attention span in a lot of ways. Um, so in many ways, while I was composing it, I just, as much as I was thinking about how to get the narrative to flow or the kind of content to um, peak in these different wavelengths, I also wanted to, I was thinking about color and font size and different ways to keep it variable enough because my first draft of it was just black text on a white screen that I'm just in an endless vertical scroll and obviously that was going to put everyone to sleep and not um, hit these very like different emotive tones and um, so that's I guess how I thought of the uh, the rhythm there's also you know captioning and text are included as both giving sometimes the text doesn't sync up with the sound but there's always text for whatever is sounded so that um, deaf or hard of hearing audiences could access it, um, which just creates, I guess, like a plethora sometimes of text and sound, but also silence at times. So it, it asks you to tune in and pay attention to what is only written and what is um, given sound. Uh, that question that I just asked you that you just beautifully answered was from Ariel Angel. This next question is from Ariel Tonkin. I don't know if you know Ariel Tonkin. I know Ariel. Uh, Ariel says, hi, cats. Hi, Greg. It's such a feeling of mishpocha to listen to you both. I'm curious about the notion of text elucidating and obscuring in art and in Torah study. There's a, there's a Talmud sugya that's a favorite in Svara, the queer yeshiva, about someone who is sick and whether or not and how and according to whom they may eat on Yom Kippur. The sugya lands with the line, the heart knows its own bitterness, quote unquote, the heart knows its own bitterness, as a proof for why the sick person in the sugya should decide for themselves. How does the sugya braid with the humor and agency and intergenerational interplay in the film and in the opening and closing of the language? Well, Thank you. That's a dense question. I just need a second. I mean, Greg, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, uh, that's uh, a dense but beautifully yes. floating matzo ball of a question. Uh, the heart knows its own bitterness um, is braided, uh, as uh, Ariel says, uh, with humor and ag agency and intergenerational interplay. Uh, in the opening and closing of language. Uh, it's, it's such a well put question. Um, and I think, uh, Katz, your film does that so beautifully because alongside the uh, humor is the bitterness. Um, and in the humor, there's the bitterness and, and it's adjacent seed anxiety. Um, and it, it is centered on the ethics that uh, Ariel is talking about, that only, only the individual can decide for themselves um, whether or not to fast on Yom Kippur or, or and, um, you know, and you know, my rabbi, you know, I'm diabetic. My rabbi says, you know, don't, you know, don't, you don't have to fast, you know, um, yeah, I can't fast. Uh, 
And so I, it's a beautiful question. And I wish we had, uh, I wish we were in the Beit Midrash and we could discuss this all night, but actually we're in the virtual and um, we've hit eight o'clock. So thank you so much, Katz, for your yes, work. Thank you for this. Uh, I, I love this question and it will be reverberating in me for a bit uh, in, in a nice slow um, slow cook. But uh, thank you so much, everybody who came. And thank you so much, Greg, and to Jewish Currents, both of your work. Um, I wouldn't have been able to make this without. So I really uh, am so glad that everyone got to join for today. <laughs> thank you so much, Katz, for including me in this conversation. And yes, thank you to Jewish Currents for bringing us together. And I look forward to continuing our conversation.